Hi everyone, Julie and I are going to be showing you about the digestive system today and we're going to use some new technology. It's called the Anatomarch table. Today we're going to be covering the digestive system. When we take food in, we're unable to have it absorbed by our body cells unless it's broken down. So the organs in our, our digestive system are responsible for breaking down the food both chemically and physically. So we're going to look at the different areas of the digestive system to talk to you about each one. The digestive system is actually a tube that has an opening at the mouth and an opening down at the anus as well. We're going to assume that this person has eaten a toasted sandwich. As they take a bite of the toasted sandwich, the food enters the mouth. The tongue is a massive muscle that's covered with mucous membrane. The tongue moves the food towards the teeth and the teeth grind and break down that food. Within the mouth as well, we produce saliva. Saliva is mostly made up of water, but it also has an enzyme. One of the enzymes is called amylase and that starts breaking down carbohydrate. In your toasted sandwich, you've got carbohydrate in your bread, so already your bread is breaking down. The next structure we're going to look at is the esophagus. The esophagus lies behind the trachea, the breathing tube. We're going to look at the esophagus by itself now. It's about 25 centimetres long. So in the esophagus, we have an upper esophageal sphincter and a lower esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter stops air entering the trachea. The lower esophageal sphincter allows small quantities of food to pass into the stomach. In this lower part of the esophagus, there is an action called peristalsis. That's something you'll want to remember. And it's a wave-like action. It occurs throughout the whole gastrointestinal tract and it forces the food through the gastrointestinal tract itself. So the esophagus empties into the stomach. So within the stomach, food is churned around. This is a process called segmentation and it's like a washing machine where food is moved round side to side and it's broken down into little, little particles for digestion. We're going to show you now the four quadrants of the stomach. We use this in nursing and medicine to identify areas of the abdomen and we can work out which quadrants the organs lie in. So we can see here that the stomach is lying in the left upper quadrant. While the toasted sandwich is in the stomach, it gets churned and it gets mixed with digestive juices. The digestive juices have acid and they turn that toasted sandwich into a milky material known as chyme. The chyme gets pushed through the pyloric sphincter into the duodenum and this happens about every 20 minutes. It takes about two to six hours for that stomach to enter and get the contents into the duodenum. The duodenum is the first part of the entire small intestine. The small intestine actually measures six metres in length, but most of the absorption of your toasted sandwich will occur in the first part of the small intestine, the duodenum. In the duodenum, there are these tiny finger-like projections and they're called villi, and they increase the surface area of the small intestine. There are also quite a lot of folds in that small intestine, which increases surface area as well. So that is where most of the components of the toasted sandwich will be absorbed, but other components of it will move down through the small intestine with the process of that segmentation, that washing machine action, and that peristalsis, pushing the toasted sandwich through the small intestine. So there are various organs that secrete digestive juices into the small intestine while that toasted sandwich is moving through. One of these is the pancreas. The pancreas secretes pancreatic juice, which has digestive enzymes, and they break down carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, everything that is in your toasted sandwich. So another organ that is in the digestive system is the liver. The liver produces a substance called bile, and it secretes about 500 ml of bile per day. The bile gets passed through to this tiny little gallbladder and the gallbladder stores the bile. When you eat fat, 
and there's fatty contents within the small intestine, your body senses that there's fat that needs to be digested and broken down, so the gallbladder squeezes out bile that enters the duodenum and starts to break down those fats. So Julie, can you talk about why we need to know about the location of the liver and the gallbladder? Yes, Anne, I'll talk about the location of the liver and the gallbladder. We'll just draw the quadrants onto the body again. As you can see, the liver and the gallbladder are lo located in the right upper quadrant. So if you see a doctor palpating over the right upper quadrant, it can mean that they're looking for enlargement of the liver. And this is due to um, overuse of alcohol. Sometimes the liver gets enlarged and a little bit engorged. But if a person is suffering from severe pain in the right upper quadrant, it can mean that they've got gallstones in the gallbladder. From the small intestine, the chyme enters the large intestine. There are three parts of the large intestine. There is the cecum, the main colon, and the rectum. In the cecum, we have the appendix, which is this tiny little structure here. It's an accessory organ of the digestive system, and we're really not sure what its function is. There is the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and the descending colon. This is where absorption of water and some electrolytes occurs and the formation of faeces occurs. The large bowel is responsible for this final part of digestion and for expulsion of faeces. The sigmoid colon here is an S shape and Julie I'd really like you to tell us about why we need to know about where those areas of the colon are and why we have an S shape in that sigmoid colon. Yes, and I can tell you about the different locations of the bowel. Sometimes it's important to check if the bowel is actually moving. We need to establish if we've got gurgling sounds within the bowel, and we can use a stethoscope to find this out. What we do is we listen for bowel sounds. So we're listening for those gurgling noises, and we're going to place our stethoscope over the transverse colon the ascending colon and the descending colon to listen for those bowel sounds. It would be something like this. Because um, patients sometimes don't have bowel sounds if they're post-operative and sometimes if they're vomiting a lot, you'll need to establish whether they have, the bowel is actually moving. The other important point that Anne brought up is that down at the base of the colon, there's an S-shaped bend. The reason that we need to know this is because when we need to check if the patient is actually passing feces, the best way to do this is to place the patient on their left hand side and then you can put enemas or suppositories into the bowel and the position of the left hand bend means that gravity assists with the fluid entering the bowel. This is a nasogastric tube and you can see how long it is. Sometimes as a nurse you'll be asked to pass a nasogastric tube and it's important to make sure that the tube is in the right place. So what you'll be doing is you'll be taking the nasogastric tube and passing it down a person's nose. It'll be fed down the esophagus and it will sit in the stomach. So placed on the patient it will look something like this. And this section here will be the bit that's taped into the patient's nose and this bit will be hanging outside of the patient's nose. Once the tube is in position and it's in the stomach, you need to check that it's correctly positioned and that it's not actually down in the lungs. Anne mentioned earlier that there's um, acidic juices in the stomach, so the best way to check the position of this tube is to take a syringe like this one, which is called a catheter tip syringe, attach it to the nasogastric tube and withdraw some of the stomach fluids into the tube. There's these um, contents should be acidic. If you take those acidic contents and put them on a piece of litmus paper, the litmus paper will turn red and that tells you that the tube is actually in the stomach and it's not sitting in the lungs. If you're not sure that the tube is still co positioned correctly, but having used the litmus paper, the other way to check is to take the same catheter tip syringe and draw it up to about 10 mils there Take a stethoscope place the stethoscope over the stomach and then push in 10 mils of air and you should hear a gurgling sound. That will tell you that the nasogastric tube is in the correct place also. We are now going to show you an image of an actual deceased person. This is called a cadaver 
and we're going to show you the peritoneum. We're just going to slide through the various layers of this body and we're going to start viewing the peritoneum. The peritoneum is a membrane and it covers the organs of the digestive system and it holds them loosely in place. It's a large continuous sheet of serous membrane. It lines the walls of the entire abdominal cavity called the parietal layer and forms the outer coat of the organs, the visceral layer. The greater omentum stores fat and it contributes to immunity. If there's areas of infection, for example appendicitis, it will actually wrap around those areas of infection to isolate them and to protect the other areas of the abdomen. While we're looking at this too, you can think about where those organs are actually on this body. That concludes our presentation of the digestive system.